just like to get started, everyone. Good morning, and thank you all for attending our CRLI, our Centre for Research and Learning Innovation series for 2017. We run these series uh, weekly and fortnightly about learning and innovation. We are honoured to have speakers come both nationally and internationally to talk to us about learning and innovation. Today we're honoured to have Professor David William Schaefer. David Williamson Schaefer is the Villas Distinguished Professor of Learning Science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Madison, the Oval Foundation Professor of Learning Analytics at the Alborg University in Copenhagen, and a data philosopher at Wisconsin Center for, Re for Education Research. He began his career as a classroom teacher and a teacher trainer in mathematics history, science, and English as a second language in the US with the US Peace Corps in Nepal. Professor Schaefer's MS and PhD are from the, Medi the Media Laboratory at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Today he'll be talking to us about quantitative, quantitative ethnography, or how I learned to stop worrying and love big data. Let's give him a nice warm welcome. Thank you, and uh, thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, uh, I'm talking about quantitative ethnography, which also happens to be the title of a book that just came out. I'll just pass this around if people want to take a look. Um, and uh, I should also say we had, there's some quantitative ethnography swag for those of you who want stickers for your computer. That you're happy to share with you later. Um, so before I start, I just want to uh, recognize that there are a number of people that I need to thank, including students, uh, co-workers, um, colleagues at various institutions who have contributed to the things that I'm talking about, although, of course, as always, um, all the credit goes to them and all the mistakes are mine. Um, I also, uh, this work has been generously supported by the National Science Foundation uh, in the United States, uh, which I would say anyway, but if I don't say it, then they won't pay for the cost of the trip. So, uh, very important to put that in here. Um, so, uh, I'd like to tell you about um, two things today. Um, one is why you should actually be scared about big data, and the other is what you can do about it. Um, and uh, I should point out that I imagine there's some people who are extremely sophisticated in terms of statistics, statistical methods, and some people who are extremely sophisticated in terms of their use of qualitative methods. Um, and I apologize to both groups because I will be uh, saying things that are not quite at the right level uh, for either group, and that's the only way to actually have a conversation about both together, so I apologize. Um, so, big data, it's all around us. Every time we do something, we create digital footprints that follow us around and that somebody has the potential of using uh, either for us or against us. So, when I go online and shop for a pair of garden shears, the next thing I know, people are sending me ads for garden hoses, books about gardening, movies about gardening. It turns out I actually like gardening that much. I just was buying them for my wife, right? Um, we can track uh, uh, online uh, our uh, walk to work um, or uh, our run, what we eat, how we sleep. Uh, there are even technologies now that will constantly be recording everything that we watch. You can put Alexa in your room and it will be listening to everything that you say, and at least in theory, throwing away the stuff it doesn't need, but who actually knows? <laughs> um, uh, every minute, so two thirds of the um, uh, people in the world have a social media account of some kind, which is staggering to me. Um, every minute, we produce four million tweets and posts to social media, and upload 400 hours of video which I find staggering. Now, of course, a lot of it isn't particularly interesting, um, but nevertheless, we are creating digital footprints as we move through the world. In fact, so much data that uh, the amount of information recorded is the equivalent of 2,000 books per day per man, woman, and child on the planet. More data, essentially, than was recorded up until the beginning of the internet is stored every single day. Uh, in educational circles, there are educational games and simulations. Um, they, produce it, they produce log files that show extremely complete records of things that students were doing, every move that they made, every person that they talked to, every document that they looked at. Um, and here's the problem. Okay, well, there are actually several problems. One of them is this problem, right, that uh, we're creating all this data and there's the possibility that somebody is 
paying closer attention to it than we'd like. And that's actually not the problem that I want to talk about today. It is a problem. I do care about it. It's just not my area of expertise. Um, actually, what I'd like to talk about is the problem that this raises uh, in, for statistics. Um, so this is the part where those of you who know something about statistics can grit your teeth in a minute. The, the ethnographers among us can grit their teeth. Um, so here's a set of data points. I'm not actually going to tell you for the moment what they are. It's not, it's not that important. But it's pretty hard to look at these and not at least notice that there seems to be some relationship between these points, right? Um, as the points go further along the x-axis or in this direction, they also go higher up in this direction. That's why the points uh, make a kind of jagged line. And we can actually measure the extent to which those points resemble the line. There are a couple of ways, different ways to do it. Um, measuring uh, uh, Pearson's, uh, their Pearson correlation is a good one. Um, this, it's particularly useful because if we square that number, um, we get an approximation of the amount of variance in one set of numbers that's explained by the other. So in this case, it's 90 for this. The R squared value is 90, um, which means that 90% in the change of that, whatever it is, um, is explained by the change in this, again, whatever it is. And of course, it's only 90%, and that's why the line looks kind of ragged. If we use real data, um, or at least the results from real data, right? there's a relationship between height and weight, uh, uh, especially in people who are relatively fit. When you, when you become either way too skinny or uh, way overweight, the relationship changes somewhat. Um, <clears throat> and again, uh, we, can see that that we can see that relationship because we can see there's uh, some connection between the points. In this case, um, the uh, R squared value, the amount of variance explained, is about 50%, um, which means that half of the difference in people's weight can be accounted for by differences in their height, which makes sense as you get taller. To some extent, on, in general, you're also going to get heavier because you have more body to fill out. Uh, there's a relationship between wealth and happiness as well. Um, it's, as you can see, a little bit less strong, uh, meaning that the line is less steep, um, and the amount of variance explained is smaller. It's about 25% across, uh, across the uh, across, uh, internationally, um, which means that about one quarter of people's happiness can be accounted for by their wealth. And it makes sense. We would certainly expect that life is a little bit easier when, you're, when you have more money, but that, that's not the only thing that makes people happy. So that number seems sensible. I should point out, of course, that of course this also means that one quarter of people's wealth can be accounted for by their happiness. So we don't actually know whether being wealthy makes you happy or being happy makes it easier to make money. But we know that there's a relationship between the two things. In fact, this is the general idea here is there's a correlation. Right? There's some relationship between two things in the world. Um, and we can use this concept of correlation as a way of understanding, at least in the field of education, how certain uh, educational interventions impact students. Um, uh, John Hattie, for example, came up with a long meta-analysis of um, uh, interventions. Um, and so we see that, for example, teacher feedback right, produces a 24 uh, up to a 24% change on average in student outcomes. Peer tutoring, 6%. Simulation in games, 3%. Instruction leading, 2%. Any meta-analysis like this is problematic. You're lumping the good with the bad. But the general idea right, is that 6% is a lot bigger than 2%, and 24% is a lot bigger than 6%. Uh, to put this in perspective, by the way, um, when uh, standardized tests are n normalized, that is, so standardized tests, you don't actually report the raw score, you report a normalized score, and they deliberately normalize the scores so that a change in one grade level is about 6%, which actually I find thoroughly depressing. The idea that we, our sort of baseline assumption is that students will gain sort of 6% uh, year on year out. It's, it's uh, uh, Cohen's D of, of 0.5 or a half a standard. Um, uh, so, um, we talked about um, wealth versus happiness and how there's a 25% uh, relationship between the two. Um, and of course, you all assumed that I was giving you that number because somebody did a big study and they've correlated across many, many data points. But in fact, in this chart, all we actually have is 10 pieces of information. Right? We have a very small number of data points. So it is true that those points, those actual points, are correlated with uh, R squared of 0.25. Um, but we would be very hesitant to draw any conclusion about whether or not wealth is really related to happiness if that was all the data that we had. Um, uh, this is a, to give you a uh, more visceral sense of um, what I mean. Let's say I was interested in finding out whether uh, students at the University of Sydney 
on average are taller than six feet, or if you prefer, whether they are on average they get grades better than 85 or any, or any statistic that you're interested in. So what would we do? Well, we'd find some students for the University of Sydney, and we'd actually measure their height, or if you prefer, we'd measure their grades. Um, and let's say that we gather a group of students from the University of Sydney and we conclude that their average height is over six feet. So that, doesn't that answer the question? We gather a group of students, we measure their height, and now we're going to conclude that students at the University of Sydney are on, the, on average over six foot tall. Well, we might conclude that, but we might not. Right? And the reason we might not is that what if we only measured a very small number of students? If we measured a very small number of students, their height might be over six feet, but they might not be a very good representation of the group as, as a whole. Um, this would be making what's called a, a false positive or a type one error. And in statistics, there's a way of uh, uh, managing type one error, that is making sure that you're only making false conclusions uh, under a certain, at under a certain rate, and that's a p-value, that anybody who's touched statistics in any way at some point has heard about. Um, and the idea of the p-value, right, is that um, in this case, the average height um, is, of our sample was over six feet, but if we conclude that the average height of everybody at the, uh, all students at the university is over six feet, we're actually gonna have a very large type one error. That is, our, the likelihood that we're making a mistake is more than 5%, which for reasons that nobody has ever satisfactorily explained is a level of error that we're willing to make. So essentially what we say is, yep, I'm willing to be wrong one in 20 times when I draw conclusions. Seems like if you're making really important decisions, that's a, that might be problematic, but nevertheless, that's the standard. Um, if we move to a larger sample size, right, it's likely that in fact that relationship will switch. That is our likelihood of making a mistake will go down. For those of you who are more mathematically inclined and visually inclined, there's a relationship between P, the level of false positives, and N, and it's this. Um, meaning as N goes up, P goes down. With larger sample sizes, the likelihood that I'm going to make a, a false, uh, false generalization to the larger population goes down. Unfortunately, this actually isn't the entire formula. The formula also has R squared, which is the amount, the effect size, the amount of something that's explained. So it is true that when N goes up, P goes down. But as N goes way, way up, as it does in the age of big data, the R squared goes down as well. So let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean by this and why it's problematic. So here's example one. Uh, this is a study, I'm actually not gonna cite the studies that I'm gonna, about to pick on. Um, you could probably Google them and find them, but it just seems cruel to put up somebody's study just so that you can point out that it's problematic. Um, uh, so uh, this is a study of Dragon Box. It's, it's actually a really cool game. Um, you learn uh, algebra by, uh, move it, by taking formulas um, that sometimes have letters and sometimes have pictures. Um, you pick up parts of the formula, and as you move it, as you drag it across the equal sign, um, it, the, they kind of you see them canceling out, and so you're learning algebra as this kind of very embodied uh, task of making things cancel out, and they progressively introduce algebraic uh, uh, notation and algebraic rules. So this study looked at 24,000 students who had played Dragon Box. They collected 21 million data points because, of course, when you play, you're making lots of moves and lots of choices. Um, and they identified 540,000 possible moves student could make, students could make. So things like add something on both sides, subtract something from both sides, subtract something on both sides with merging. I'm not actually sure what that means in this context, but in any case, these are all discrete moves that, this, that the students could make. And they were very conservative. They selected a p-value of 0 .001 meaning that they were willing to have a false, make a false positive, to assume that something was true when perhaps it wasn't. One in a thousand times, which is considered pretty stringent for the standards of education. Now, let's just point out that if what they're, what they're trying to do is figure out which moves matter, right? So, uh, if they're trying to figure out which moves matter, and they're uh, willing to be wrong one in a thousand times, then they're actually going to conclude 540 things are relevant just by chance alone. Um, and uh, more important, when, they act, when you actually uh, do the uh, analysis of this study, you'll find out that what they're wi going to wind up explaining is about 0.000025% of the differences in student performance. Right? Um, because there's so much data, their N is so big, 
they've made their p-value small, but they would have to make it really, really small to find anything uh, that was, uh, to find, uh, the p-value is small, but the r squared also has to get really small to make the math work out. Um, by the way, for those of you who look at that number and say like, ah, what does that even mean? It's equivalent to like 1.4 seconds of instruction. Now, I, I mean, I'm happy if I gain 1.4 seconds in something, but really how much difference is that gonna make and how much work are we doing in order to identify something like that? Uh, this is example number two. Uh, this is a group of uh, researchers who are interested in PISA, the PISA study. Um, I won't read this whole thing. Essentially, uh, it turns out Finland is one of the countries where boys perform better in mathematics than girls. So you might think, well, gee, we should look at what's going on in Finland. Um, and so what they're doing is refining their anal the analysis of this observation by using data mining. I won't bother telling you the techniques that they were using because what I want to focus on is a part of their conclusion. So taking all this piece of data and doing a sophisticated data analytics, they concluded that, uh, this is a direct quote, of course, those students who are socially and economically less advantaged have high anxiety towards mathematics and low self-concept in mathematics, but still clearly above average attitude towards school are girls who perform below level three. Now, I, I'm sorry, but I've read this like 50 <laughs> times because I use it in presentations. I actually have no idea what that means. Um, and even if I did, what would I do with that information? Like, it's very hard to, to think that this is something that you could act on. In other words, when people talk about data mining, there's this sense of we're using these sophisticated tools and we're powerfully extracting information that's hidden deep underground. In fact, a lot of what's going on might be better described as data prospecting. We're gonna take in sand and we're sifting through it and we're hoping to find some little nugget somewhere that we could do something with. Um, so that's why I suggest that rather than just doing this kind of data mining, uh, we look at, uh, at uh, big data in a more ethnographic perspective. Now when you say ethnograph ethnography, people imagine something like this. Right? But the reason that ethnography is important in the study of education is that ethnography is fundamentally the study of cultures. And that's important because learning is fundamentally a process of enculturation. Let me give you a quick example of what I mean by that. Uh, so this is a screenshot from Webkinz. Uh, it's one of my daughter's uh, all-time favorite uh, computer games. But it's an American game, so of course, in, in order to play, you have to buy a plush toy, a stuffed animal. Um, and the stuffed animal appears in the world, and you can ask questions of your pet, uh, and the pet can give you kind of pro-social responses, uh, enforcing what it means to be a responsible person in the world. Um, the main mechanic, of course, is that you buy stuff for your pet. Um, in order to buy stuff for your pet, you have to earn money. So you can, uh, well, you can gamble. <laughs> um, you can play educational games. This one is called Booger Gets an A. Uh, you try and find two smaller numbers that add up to some larger number. Um, and when you're successful, you get kind of reinforcing messages about mathematics and uh, its role in, in the world. Um, you can, I kid you not, go to work in the mines. Um, and then there's a host of other 21st century things you can do, like painting fences, uh, delivering newspapers, or being someone's personal assistant. In other words, what this game is showing is part of the way that culture works, and by playing the game, you're learning about things like buying stuff and the importance of money and the fact that to get money, you're gonna to have to do things that are considered demeaning or menial, right? Um, in other words, it's about learning a particular culture. Um, and using the term culture, um, uh, I'm borrowing from uh, concepts uh, from Jim G's notion of discourse analysis, that culture is organized around what he calls big D discourses, so that it's the ways in, way in which some group in the world uh, uses language, they think, they feel, they believe, they value, and acting that marks them as part of that group and also helps them uh, deal with the issues in the world that people in that group think about. Um, in other words, we understand culture by making sense of discourse. Let me give you a quick example of that. So, so I grew up in New York City. I'm a city boy through and through, um, which means that when I am walking around and I see a patch of dirt on the ground, the only thing I'm thinking about is, well, did it rain recently because if the, if the dirt is wet, I'm gonna get my shoes muddy when I walk through it. On the other hand, Charles Goodwin points out that when an archeologist looks at a uh, patch of dirt, they think about it in a very different way. They think about it as to whether there's evidence of pat, <coughs> excuse me, past activity uh, <coughs> in the surviving artifacts in the bread. <coughs> Sorry. So things like post holes. Is this a place where people used to inhabit and there used to be a fence? The way that you can find the uh, evidence of a post hole, for example, is that when the post degrades, it's, there's actually a different quality of material 
Um, and so it has different properties, including that it has, may be colored differently than the surrounding soil. That's why archaeologists use something called the Munsell color chart to look at pieces of soil, to systematically grade the, the color of the soil, and then look for places where that coloration is, is different. Um, in other words, archaeologists care about soil. They care about Munsell car uh, color charts. They care about post holes. These are the ways in which they encode experience, and uh, Goodwin calls these ways of encoding experience codes, which I'm calling the big C code following from Jim G's idea of a big D discourse. Um, in other words, <coughs> understanding a discourse, understanding the way people act and make sense of the world, means understanding their codes, the things that they mark as being important in the world. Um, going a step beyond um, Goodwin's work, though, I have argued that it's not just about understanding the codes. We also have to understand how those codes are systematically related to one another. In other words, for an archaeologist, a Munsell color chart is meaningful because it's something that you use to analyze soil. And it's meaningful because it's something that you use in order to understand, uh, find things like evidence of post holes. But those things are related to one another. Uh, in my work, I've described this as an epistemic frame, which is a nice metaphor. You can think of it like a pair of glasses that you put on to see the world from a certain perspective, from the perspective of an archaeologist or of a, <coughs> a doctor or a lawyer. Right? And we all have these frames. Right? And I know this because right now I'm using the epistemic frame of a professor. Right? I'm standing up in front of you. I'm presenting slides. I'm talking. Right? And I know that this is just one of the many frames that I have because when I go home and I do this, my kids don't really like it. They don't like the slides, they think they're boring. Right? They, I'm talking all the time, they really want to participate. Right? So I, I have on the wrong epistemic, fr uh, epistemic frame. Right? I need to switch to the, my epistemic frame of being a dad. Um, and the idea about these epistemic frames is that they're composed of the particular codes, as Goodwin argues, and also the way in which those codes are systematically related. Uh, in other words, learning is not just about accruing specific pieces of information or specific skills or particular ways of seeing it's about understanding the way those things are related to one another or to put it in terms of our diagram we understand a culture by understanding its discourse and there and we do that by understanding the codes and the way those codes are systematically related to one another so that's all very abstract let me ground this out by giving you a kind of specific example for my work although Feel free to think about the way that this might apply to things that you study, right? Whatever you study has some kind of codes, and this is true whether you do it qualitatively or quantitatively. In the quantitative world, sometimes those are called variables, obviously. But, um, but So you can feel free to think about it in your own terms, although I'm gonna just give you an example so we have some uh, common ground here. Um, so I'm interested in complex collaborative problem solving, how, how people learn it, and also how we can assess it. We develop things called virtual internships that give students a chance to solve real world complex problems in teams. I'm gonna show you a little video, it's kind of a promotional video, I don't even think I'll, I'll show you the whole thing. Um, just to give you a flavor of what the students are doing and then we'll, uh, some common ground to talk about uh, what's going on and why. In the engineering virtual internship rescue shell, students become interns in a simulated robotics design firm called Rescue Tech. Interns at Rescue Tech are placed in project teams and face the challenge of designing an advanced robotic exoskeleton to be used by rescue workers in dangerous or demanding situations. It's an opportunity to learn about engineering design by working on a real engineering design problem. Which is an online virtual internship allowed us to get more real life experience as much as we were like in a workplace or working with actual people in a realistic experience. Interns receive assignments from their boss via email, and they communicate with each other and the design advisors via chat. The design advisors are live mentors who provide guidance and feedback, model professional conduct, and assist interns when they get stuck. Okay, so let's stop there. There's, there's more we can tell you about the virtual internships, but I'm just using them as a sort of a data source at this point. Um, so one of the things we just saw is that Part of the way that these students are solving a complex problem is by communicating with one another in a chat. So we have a record of what they were saying. There's the big data for you, right? Um, and when we look at that at those at the chat, we see students say things like this: Yes, one of my designs had a payload of 718, agility 281, recharge interval of 7.88, safety 183, and price of $14,000. These attributes all meet company standards. In other words, in this one piece of chat. A student is referring to data, using data, and they're also using data to relate to the technical requirements for their design. Um, in other words, what's happening is 
right? We want to understand this culture and the way in which these big C codes are systematically related to one another, but what we have is discourse. We have the actual things that specific people said and did. Um, and in fact, to be fair, we don't really have discourse. We have something that looks like this. We have what we might call field notes or a log file. We have some record of discourse, a partial record of what happened. And the problem is we can't just go from looking at a file like that or even as ethnographers looking at our field notes and directly understand what's going on in the culture. We can't directly understand what's going on in the discourse. In fact, we can't even directly, just through observation, understand what the codes are. Um, we need what uh, Andrew Pickering calls a machinic grip. And the idea of a machinic grip is that um, concepts in the world, things that happen, are they're complicated, they're messy, they're ephemeral in some cases, and the only way to understand them from a scientific, and by this I mean smallest scientific, the only way to investigate them is that we have to find some way of attaching the tools of, of our investigation to the phenomenon. And once we made that at the point of attachment, then we can start to move things around, we can look at them from different perspectives, we can uh, extract additional information. And in uh, ethnography, this ma uh, machinic grip um, is, uh, is based on the, these codes, these big C codes, right, which are culturally relevant and meaningful aspects of a discourse. And the machinic grip is the way that those big C codes can get represented as small C codes or things that count as evidence or warrants for the big C codes. Um, now again, I, this is, for those of you who are ethnographers and even probably for anybody in this room, this is not, this is not anything that's dramatically new, right? People write code books. Um, they put down the things they're coding for, like technical requirements or data, they put down a definition, they put down um, examples. And what's important is that this link between the small C codes, the things I can see in the data, and the big C codes, the things that are the meaningful things that I think other people are seeing and, ha and that are happening, this is the link between the stuff in the world on the left-hand side, the stuff that's observable, and the phenomenon that I'm actually interested in understanding. Now again, this is not something that should be new to many of you. This is just a process of thick description. Right? And part of thick description is figuring out when the description is thin enough. That is, when you don't have a thin description, um, when you've actually collected enough data that the story that you're telling is a, rep is a good representation of the experience and the ways that people in the culture make meaning. Um, and we do that not typically not just by showing one example, but by showing multiple examples so that we understand that this pattern is something that recurs. This is a process, of course, that's referred to sometimes as theoretical saturation. Right? And it's the idea that we've collected enough data and we've analyzed enough data such that if we continue to look at more and more data, our story is not going to change fundamentally. Um, so uh, with that in mind, let me tell you a little story about Rescue Shell, and then we'll look and see sort of how this process can work. Um, so this is the uh, uh, excerpt from a conversation from one group of students um, who are working on their design problem. And I should tell you that the way the internship is organized, students work in groups and they examine one aspect of the design problem, but different aspects. And then there's a jigsaw. So we take one person from each group that's looked at one part and we put them all together and then they're able to use that information to solve the design problem as a whole. So this is at the, basically at the moment where they're reconfiguring into their new group. Um, and their design advisor, the sort of a, adult character in the simulation, um, says, please take a moment to introduce yourselves and indicate what actuator you have experience with. And that's where he's referring to the different parts of the problem. And we can see the students, uh, the students all say, hi, hi, everybody. I work with Pam, I'm from Pneumatic, and so forth. Right? Um, as the conversation proceeds, they start to actually discuss not just kind of what the general topic area they worked at with, but what prototypes they created and how those prototypes performed. So we see Zachary saying, for hydraulic payload and recharge interval were strengths, but the safety was close to the company requirements. Um, Elizabeth talks about the way that um, her group were able to reach all internal consultants' requirements, but the machine was too expensive. Um, uh, Gabrielle talks about the required and preferred um, requirements from the, uh, from the technical specifications. In other words, there's this move to talking about how the device is performed. But there's an important thing that happens towards the end of this little excerpt, which is that Michael makes a move from talking about whether or not the device is performed well to talking about how well they perform. He asks about the results of the best prototype for each of the groups. In other words, he asks for data. And what happens next in the conversation is that um, <clears throat> the students start to talk about 
the same devices, but now in more specific terms. Right? Zachary talks about the agility of 203, recharge interval of 8.7. Lena talks about the safety as 109 and 190, and the cost is 12,875, and so on. And this actual kind of digging into the specifics of the device leads Zachary to say, to start concluding the kind of uh, uh, introducing the relative benefits of each of these devices. And then finally, at the end of this, this segment, Elizabeth says, okay, we need to determine which attributes are most important to us so that we can meet those requirements. She starts to move into the realm of talking about design trade-offs. Um, so in other words, the story that I'm, uh, that I'm telling you is that there's a relationship among the technical requirements data and design trade-offs. And of course, what they're doing as designers ultimately is figuring out how to make design <laughs> trade-offs to meet the technical requirements as best as they can. But they don't go directly from one to the other. They start talking about technical requirements and make the connection between technical requirements and data. And then they make the connection between data and design trade-offs, that this is the pattern. Now, I could convince you that this pattern is uh, true in the data by showing you not just one example, but by showing you many examples. Um, I could show you theoretical saturation in a typical qualitative way, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's a good thing to do. I encourage everybody to do that, even if they're doing purely quantitative research. Actually show me some examples so that I can understand what's going on. Um, but we can also use quantitative tools to establish theoretical saturation, and that's the basic idea of quantitative ethnography. Um, so in order to show how to do that, let me just focus on one piece of this. So I said there's a connection between technical requirements and data. Well, what does it mean to make a connection if you're working on a design problem? Well, we actually saw an example of this. This is the excerpt that I showed you a little while ago. And as we know, the student's talking about technical requirements and data. And there's the connection. They're showing us that, in fact, they see a relationship between these things. Now, unfortunately, when people are actually working in groups or even working by themselves, uh, ideas are not related to one another. Skills are not related to one another. Values are not invoked. Just all right in one instant. The things unfold over time. And we saw this. For example, when Elizabeth starts talking about design trade-offs, she's talking about this in the context and referring back to the previous discussion about data. In other words, connections don't just get made within something that one person says. They get made across things that people say um, during, this, during some uh, uh, segment of activity. Dan Southers and uh, his colleagues talk about this in terms of recent temporal context. An easier way to think about it is maybe common ground. Right? When people are having a discussion, when people are working, even when somebody's working individually, there's a certain period of, of recent events that are kind of held uh, uh, close to the present, such that I, as, as I'm talking, I assume that everybody else in the conversation will remember the things that happened just recently. If I'm referring to something very far back in the past, it's not that I don't remember it, but it's that I don't necessarily know that you remember it. And so what I do is re-invoke it. I bring it back into the present. I mean, what that means is we can model the way in which connections are, get made by using a moving window. We can take any one line of action. I'm showing you discourse, but this could be mouse clicks. It could be anything. Um, and we look back for, over some window, and we see what other codes the things that are present in the current turn are related to. We take that window when we slide it down a little, and then we repeat the process. In other words, we take the record of activity, and we see in each turn, turn of talk or turn of action, what connections are being made. And that means that we can now model the temporal unfolding of activity as a progressively more complicated um, network of, uh, epistemic network. So for example, one group might make a connection between technical requirements and data, what we were just talking about. As the conversation continues, other connections get made, some connections get reinforced, new connections come, up, come along. A different group or a different person might make connections in a different way. They might connect more to, between collaboration and technical requirements, and then reinforce that, and then make new connections, and so on. In other words, the idea of an epistemic frame is that we have to care about the connections between the codes, but the codes aren't necessarily all connected in exactly the same way. Some connections are stronger, some connections are weaker. At different points in time, different things are connected. And this kind of analysis, this trying to understand the way an epistemic frame works, trying to understand the connections between codes, the way people make meaning in the world, um, through a network analysis is called epistemic network analysis. So I'm going to show another short video um, to kind of give you an intuition about how this works, let's just say. Uh, and this is um, from uh, a video from Law and Order Special Victims Unit. Uh, I can tell you why we chose that, uh, that 
at the end if you have questions. But um, I'm going to show you a scene of three people trying to solve a complicated um, or having a complicated discussion about uh, technical issues on a case. I'm actually going to show it to you twice. So the first time I'm going to show with a transcript, um, probably that just makes it easier to follow if you're looking at a distance, but also it models what you would see if you were looking at a log file. Right? You would see the transcript of what happened. And the second time I'll show exactly the same scene, except now instead of the transcript, what you're going to see is the epistemic network, the epistemic frame modeled and how that model unfolds over time. Her affect was flat, almost associative. Do you think she's setting the stage for a psych defense? Well, it'll be hard going she is. Because she's faking it. No, because DSM-4 diagnostic standards still don't exist for postpartum psychiatric illnesses. Here we go. Many courts bar its admission. That's the reason why infanticide sentences vary so wildly in this country. Some women are given the death penalty, and others are given probation. You think postpartum depression should excuse murdering your child? It's not depression. I think she's suffering from postpartum psychosis. Giving birth made her crazy. It's a hormonal imbalance stemming from pregnancy. Its onset can be quick and severe. Its symptoms include agitation, hallucinations, delusions. The Andrea Yates defense. Look, the only thing making this girl crazy is a baby's father. I don't know what part he played, but I know that he's involved. So from the law book, in a general way, we can see that these people are looking at the problem differently. Her affect was flat, almost associated. You think she's setting the stage for a psych defense? Well, it'll be hard going if she is. Because she's faking it. No, because DSM-4 diagnostic standards still don't exist for postpartum psychiatric illnesses. Here we go. Many courts bar its admission. That's the reason why infanticide sentences vary so wildly in this country. Some women are given the death penalty, and others are given probation. You think postpartum depression should excuse murdering your child? It's not depression. I think she's suffering from postpartum psychosis. Giving birth made her crazy. It's a hormonal imbalance stemming from pregnancy. Its onset can be quick and severe. Its symptoms include agitation, hallucinations, delusions. The Andrea Yates defense. Look, the only thing making this girl crazy is a baby's father. I don't know what part he played, but I know that he's involved. Lou. So we see three different people who have a different perspective on the same issue, and we can see that perspective now represented in a visual and mathematical way that we could, uh, and we can uh, exa examine the differences in a way that's different, not better than, but different than just looking at the uh, original dialogue. Um, one of the things this illustrates, right, is that we can, if we have one person, they might have, or one group might have one network, another might have another network, and we can compare them, right? We can look at the networks side by side, or in this case, laid on top of one another, and see, well, where are the differences? Well, that works fine for two or three networks, but if you have a large number of networks, well, that will get very tiring very fast. Um, one of the things we can do, though, with this uh, quantitative representation is that we can summarize where, the way in which the net, uh, one network is connected compared to another by looking at the centroid. So the centroid is just the center of mass. Or imagine if these were actually sticks of wood or, or, or some physical object, and the thicker ones weigh more than the thinner ones do. This is where, that would, this, is where this network would balance. Um, and the red network would balance over on the other side because the connections are stronger on the other side of the network. And so now we can compare these networks not just by looking at the actual lines of the network, but we can look at those points as a, as a more abstract representation of the network. And we can look at those points as now uh, it, within a metric space. We can measure the distances or the differences between networks. Um, I'm not going to go into the mathematics, although I'm happy to bore you ad nauseum, or you can read this, although that doesn't actually go into all the details of the mathematics. There are plenty of papers for that as well. But basically what's happening is uh, a network can be represented as a matrix of connections. We take those matrices, we project them into a higher dimensional space, and then we do a dimensional reduction of these co-occurrence matrices to position the points. Um, and then we position the nodes around the points. Um, we use an optimization routine. And we do that so that there's a correspondence between where the network lines are heaviest visually and where the points are, the point of the network is located, the center of the network is located. Um, in other words, by doing that optimization, we make sure that the red point is on the left because that's where the highest connections are, and the blue point is on the right because that's where the highest connections are. By the way, I, I might point out that this little piece of the network, this is exactly the story that I was telling you, right? That technical requirements are connected to data and connected to design trade-offs more uh, more strongly than technical requirements are correct, connected directly to design trade-offs. If you have trouble seeing that, just imagine placing like this. Um, all right, so uh, let me show you just a little bit of data. Um, so this is data from uh, 50 students. Um, these are first-year college students. 25 of them are 
uh, novices and 25 or more advanced. Um, so this is uh, and they, they, this is uh, over, I think it's 12 hour, 12 to 15 hours of design work. Um, so 50 students, 12 to 15 hours of design work in teams of four. Right. So that's not as big as some big data sets, but it's big enough that if you actually wanted to look at the whole thing qualitatively, it would take your graduate students a while to do that. Um, so this is uh, uh, this is the um, the actual uh, mean network for the more advanced students. So if we look across the different students and the contributions they're making, this is the average network. I should be quick to say, by the way, that one of the really useful things about this technique is it solves or it, it helps solve a very fundamental problem in uh, collaborative learning and assessing collaborative learning. Right? So one of the challenges in collaborative learning is we can measure what the team does, right? and we can measure what individuals do, but figuring out what role the individual has played in the success or failure of the team is, is more complicated. Because of the way this modeling works, because of the way the moving window works, at, at any, given, any given action, we can, uh, we can model the, the connections that any given action makes, and those connections are not just to the things that the same person did, it's to the things that the people on the team were doing. So now we can actually have a model of the whole team that we can decompose into the specific contributions of each person in the context of the rest of the team. Oh, anyway, so this is the um, this is the uh, at more advanced students. Uh, this is the more novice students. Um, you can see just as the network changed that there's there's a difference. Um, it's a little easier to see if I actually subtract the two networks. So now the red lines represent the connections that were stronger for the novices. The blue lines represent uh, represent the connections that were stronger for the advanced students. And of course, because of the way these networks are constructed, each of the individual students as well as the mean. Um, also has a point that represents that network. The points are the centroids of, uh, of these uh, larger network graphs that are distributed in various ways. I'm just going to zoom in for a moment. Right, so here we have the novices and the relative experts. Right, and on this representation, each of these dots represents one student and the epistemic network that uh, represents their contributions to their team. And then these represent the means of all the experts and the mean, a mean of all the novices. Um, but now, I can actually, I have a sample and I can perform a statistical test. So in this case, with an N of 50 and a relatively low p-value, we're able to explain 49% of the difference between the way in which these students are working by just whether they're experts or novices. And you might say, well, 45%, 40% of what? Well, because of the way this has been constructed, we can actually interpret this metric space. Right? Um, <coughs> the things that are on the right side of the metric space are making more connections to things that are uh, to the, uh, that are on the right. In particular, uh, more connections to things like data. The things that are on the left side, the hand side of the space, are making more collections, connections to things like things like collaboration. And it actually makes sense, right? If you are take complete novices and you ask them to perform an engineering task, the first thing they have to do is figure out who's supposed to do what. So there's going to be a lot more explicit discussion of collaboration among the novices. The experts don't need to spend as much time working that problem out. And so they move on and start talking about the other aspects of the design problem, thinking about data, thinking about their prototypes, and so on. In other words, what's happening here is, in addition to the pathway that we would ordinarily have in um, uh, analyzing data qualitatively, we have a second path. We have a statistical warrant. And essentially what that statistical warrant is doing is saying that the pattern that we saw in some small piece of data pertains across this, uh, this data set more generally. In other words, we have a warrant for theoretical saturation. But I'd like to make a couple points about this particular kind of warrant for theoretical saturation, this particular kind of statistical analysis of a, a large data set. And that is, this model represents an immense um, uh, con uh, con condensation of the data. Right? Each of these data points represents uh, the the, uh, everything that a student did, that one student did over 15 hours in this large collection of students. This is thousands of lines of chat that we are modeling and kind of crunching the data down. The nice thing about the way this representation has been, or this model has been constructed, is that if I can actually interrogate each of those points and see for any one point what connections the point is actually representing. But more than that, I can click on one of the connections and I can go back to the original data. I can see which of those windows in time 
are, in, in which of those windows of time the connections are being made. I can go back and actually read the text. This is not that text, but um, I can go back and read the text and see what's actually behind all of those connections that are behind all of those data points that are behind my statistical conclusion that are a way of warranting this pattern that I saw. Um, put another way, in addition to providing, it, it provides us a, a warrant for, um, for a theoretical saturation, but a warrant that we can ground out again. We, we don't just take an idea about how something is functioning, build an elaborate model, and then see whether the model agrees with us. We can actually pick up the hood of the model and go in and make sure that the model is doing what we think it's doing. Um, in other words, we get, uh, we get theoretical saturation and a grounded analysis, which means that our statistics are actually directly supporting the thick descriptive activity. We are keeping those two things tied closely to one another. It's not a mixed methods model where I look at the data qualitatively and then in some other way or maybe even sometimes with some other data I look at the same phenomenon quantitatively and I say, oh, those agree. I'm actually using the statistics to model the very thing that I'm claiming in my grounded analysis. Uh, which makes this thick, uh, big data for thick description. And why does that matter other than that we might be more convinced that in fact we're telling a story that's going to be useful? Well, it means that this model is actually more directly actionable. So this is a a screenshot of a, a view into the data that we provide teachers or the people who are uh, running virtual internships. And in this view, uh, the person can see the chat or the activity that's going on. They can see the model that the system is making of the connections that are being made. Right? And because, we, because that model is meaningful in the ways that we've just been talking about, it means that it's actually easy, it, it makes it actionable. Right? If I want to intervene, all I have to do is look at the model of what students have, connections students have made, find a place where they haven't seen the two things are related, and perhaps suggest that they start thinking about this other aspect of the problem. Um, so in other words, I started out by telling you why you should be scared. Okay, and here's one reason, there are lots of reasons you should be scared. I mean, Donald Trump's president, perhaps. But, um, right, you should be scared because big data can produce nonsense if we use it without thinking about what it really means. And it's extremely tempting to do that. There are, in fact, people who say, we don't, need, we don't need theory, we don't need anything but correlation. We have tons of data, throw it in a model and see what's related to what. Um, but I'm also talking about what you can, talk about what you can do about it. Um, and what you can do about it is this. You can use quantitative ethnography. You can use tools that don't separate the statistical analyses from the underlying sense making. Um, that don't see these as two separate processes. That is, we can move towards an integrated science of how people make meaning that accounts for both uh, the grounded understandings that we get from qualitative research and the statistical, uh, the uh, ability to generalize that we get from uh, uh, statistics. Um, so I'm going to stop there. There's a website. If, if you're not interested in buying the book, the, uh, and by the way, I'm not actually shilling for the book. I make no money on it, but um, but I want to get the ideas in circulation. So you can also go to the uh, this website, which refers to some uh, tools that you can get access to the papers. Uh, and I should add, um, for people who are interested in using these techniques with their data, so particularly graduate students, for example, um, our funding is such that we have a team of students um, whose part and part of their job is to actually work with people who are trying to use quantitative ethnographic methods for the first time. So. That's everything from helping talk about how you might want to be coding your data, talk about how you might actually organize your data, uh, run some first analyses and sort of work through how you might interpret them and also show you how the tools work. Um, so there's lots of resources available. Um, I should also mention that we have some nice swag to give away. So if you've been enjoying the stickers that are on my computer, you can have one for yourself. They're free for the taking. Um, anyway, but so thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate especially those of you who are nodding at the appropriate points in the talk. <laughs> always very helpful. Um, uh, but th thanks for giving me a chance to talk, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions or and to discuss things further.